This is the periodic table. The elements circled in red have no stable isotopes. They're radioactive. There's all these super heavy ones down here. And then, element number 43, technetium. Why? But first, let's remind ourselves why the heavy elements at the bottom are radioactive. Heavy elements tend to have a higher proportion of neutrons in their nuclei, meaning that the protons and neutrons don't bond together very strongly, hence they're not stable. But this logic doesn't apply to technetium since it's so much lighter. So what's going on here? You might be aware that electrons organize themselves into energy levels around the nucleus. This is what we call electronic structure. This is commonly discussed in secondary school, probably because it links quite nicely to the chemical behavior of the atoms. But what isn't discussed in school is the stability and configurations of the nucleus. This is what determines whether an atom will exist or disintegrate. And for this, we'll have to go past the periodic table. The periodic table is organized to reflect the electronic structure of the elements. It shows how the electrons are arranged. During the 1930s, when nuclear science became a reality and the number of known radioisotopes exploded, we began developing what we call the chart of nuclides, which organizes the isotopes with proton number Z on one axis and neutron number N on the other. By taking the chart of nuclides and removing the unstable elements, we can see what we call the value of stability. Elements with more protons than neutrons will decay by electron capture to lower themselves into the valley. Elements with more neutrons will decay by electron emission to do so. Surely, if we can spot a pattern between stable nuclei, we can build a model which predicts that technetium is unstable. Now, we can look for patterns within the valley stability by analyzing the composition of the stable nuclei. We can start by comparing whether their proton number, neutron number, and atomic weight are even or odd. This process generates the table you see now, where each stable isotope falls into one of four different categories. Further analysis of the stability of these even nuclides suggests the pairing of nucleons, like how electrons are paired in orbitals. From this, we've developed the nuclear shell model and the concept of magic numbers, but we won't go into that today. So why are there no stable technetium isotopes? From the chart, we can see that the value of stability falls within a certain region of the chart. So for a technetium isotope to be stable, it should have a similar neutron number to proton number ratio to nearby stable isotopes. Also, given that technetium has an odd proton number, from the table, we can see that a stable isotope should have an even neutron number and an odd atomic weight. This analysis therefore predicts two stable isotopes, technetium-97 and technetium-99. But in reality, although these are the isotopes with the longest half-lives, they are still not stable. Fortunately for us, thanks to a bohemian physicist named Joseph M, there is another empirical trend from this chart which explains why these isotopes aren't actually stable. On the chart of nuclides, an isobar is a line of constant atomic weight, such as sulfur-40, chlorine-40, argon-40, potassium-40 and calcium-40. Matauk's rule says that no two adjacent nuclides in an isobar can both be stable. The reasoning for this is that if there is a stable element a small decay step away on the same isobar, then in theory this would be favoured at that particular atomic weight. So if technetium has stable isotopes, then both molybdenum and ruthenium must not have stable isotopes with identical atomic weights. As you can see in the table, the rule does correctly predict that technetium doesn't have any stable isotopes. It also correctly predicts the radioactivity of promethium, another outlier. This is all well and good, but you're probably still wondering why. We can use Matauk's rule, but where is the physical intuition for it? When the nucleons join to form a nucleus, they give out some energy as they bond together. This means there's an overall energy difference between unbonded nucleons and bonded nucleons in a nucleus. This energy difference is called the mass defect. As we know, mass and energy are interchangeable through the mass-energy equivalence, or E equals mc squared. So the mass of a nucleus is equal to the separate masses of the nucleons minus the mass defect. Rewriting this equation, we can define the mass of the nucleus as a function of the Coulomb forces, the mass defect, and the nucleus size, or atomic weight. Now we can have another look at those isobars, that is, lines of constant atomic weight. You can take the parabola given by this equation for isotopic mass to visualize the value of stability. Higher energy isotopes decay in order to move down into the valley. Once they've given out as much energy as possible to get the most negative mass defect, 
they have reached the valley where the stable isotopes exist. In the case of technetium, there are simply lower points on the energy parabola at each isobar. So for each atomic weight of a technetium isotope, there are more energetically favourable and therefore more stable ways to pack that number of nucleons. So each technetium isotope radiates energy in order to slip down to, into a more stable state. This means there are no stable technetium isotopes, which is why it's radioactive. Through experimentation, we have confirmed this theory by measuring the mass defect of technetium isotopes, which, as expected, are smaller than that of molybdenum and ruthenium isotopes for every relevant atomic weight. Remember, the smaller the mass defect, the less stable the isotope is. The title question was never just about why one element is radioactive, because as we've seen, the stability of each element depends on the stability of adjacent elements along an isobar. Hopefully you should see the radioactivity of element 43 as less of an anomaly, but as a consequence of the range of nuclear configurations that are possible.